Well, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I think we have to start off by saying that the relationship between church and state, of course, has nothing to do with the church. This is an entirely set-up operation by the state. It was invented by the state to tame the church. It was the time in which uh, Henry VIII uh, uh, got rid of popular religion and made it state religion, and that is exactly what happened. And it is both the curse and the reason for the continuance of the Church of England. Um, and I think this is a really important issue because uh, politicians who get um, upset with the Church and of England and say, you know, it shouldn't interfere in these things, of course, are absolutely right because that is actually what the Church of England is there for. It's not there historically to comment on the state, it is there to be the arm of the state. That is what happened in the Reformation. Lots of other things happened and there are lots of arguments about it, but that's actually what happened. And therefore, your comments uh, uh, were absolutely right in terms of the complicated uh, mechanisms which we use in order to bind the Church of England to the state but it remains to be one of the really difficult issues. And I suppose one of the fundamental drivers behind my own movement from the Church of England was that it seemed to me to be no longer possible, even if it ever was, to maintain this fiction, uh, which is that the church and state is a partnership. But it isn't a partnership. It never was meant to be a partnership. And therefore, when Mrs. Thatcher used to get uh, upset about certain bishops, and most prime ministers do in one way or another, they, they, they were perfectly right constitutionally, because bishops have no right, no business, Church of England bishops have no right or business to be criticising the, the, the state. Historically, that's not what it was about. And, and I think unless one starts there, it's very difficult to understand the ambivalence which you find uh, even with believing politicians when it comes to them handling the Church of England. And it's also very difficult to understand the ambivalence of the Church of England when it comes to their dealing with politics. Because the relationship between church and state is, now that there isn't a Byzantine Empire, I think unparalleled anywhere else. I don't think there is anywhere where this particular relationship is true. I mean, even in countries where there is a close relationship between church and state, uh, particularly, for example, which is recrudescence of that in, uh, uh, in, in Russia and where there is certainly in Greece, it is two different bodies coming together and seeing a, common, a commonness in what they have to deal with. It isn't one body that has long ago decided that it is in charge. And of course, none of us learn this properly in our history lessons because our history is extremely biased. We learn that what happened was that the British people no longer wanted to be ruled by a foreign potentate, the Pope, but wanted to be ruled by their own king. Actually, that was very convenient for the king because that's what he was saying. He was saying, not him, but me. Um, and I take to myself not even in the restricted sense that um, Queen Elizabeth I had, which is as far as the law of Christ allows. There wasn't any as far as the law of Christ allows. According to Henry VIII, he was the head of the church in the sense that he meant it to be. And now, he would invent all sorts of things about the anointment, uh, anointing and the uh, coronation and all the rest of it, giving him that sort of power. But the truth is that we live in a state which long ago decided that the church was subservient to the civil power in a way which was far beyond merely the issues about whether there were church courts and whether priests were subject to the national law and those sort of issues which have been uh, concerns everywhere else. Now, what that, what that means, of course, is that in trying to deal with the state-church relationship, and in this case, I want to define the church, if you like, as the church-Christian relationship, because uh, that is still uh, the, the, 
the, the central religious understanding of the British people. In, in that, it, it starts off in a difficult, ambivalent situation, and both sides find that so. So let's have a look at it uh, recently. And, uh, of course, one has to recognise that we have had prime ministers for whom these matters didn't really count. But it's surprising how many we've had as you yourself said, uh, uh, who, where he did count. And I remember after his uh, retirement being called to Harold Macmillan, uh, who uh, in his later years left a number of stories about himself which he would, uh, he would pass on to people so that they would be bound to tell them in Cambridge all these years later. That's what he did. And he, um, he said to me, Birch Grove, he'd asked me to come early for a dinner where other people were going to be present. He said, oh, I said I'm very, very pleased, very, very pleased that you should come. And he said, because like me, you feel very strongly about the church. Now, I've always felt strongly about the church. I've always gone to Holy Communion every Sunday, always. And I've loved the church's year, Advent, Christmas, Easter, even those new, those new Sundays. Bible Sunday and Harvest Thanksgiving, even like that. But he said it's very difficult in this parish. He said very, very difficult indeed. We've got a, we've got a, we've got a vicar who's very keen on freedom fighters. He said it's one guerrilla Sunday after another. <laughs> <laughs> now here was a man who was was a noble Christian, uh, but he could not conceive of Christianity except within that context of, if I may put it like this, polite Anglicanism. In other words, his Christianity, deep and, and real, a man who'd read considerably, his Christianity was very much affected by the expected relationship between church and state, which was a comfortable, supportive, warm relationship. And therefore, when friends of his, like Archbishop Runsey, uh, before he was Archbishop, would say things which were sharp and uh, painful, uh, even to a man who, after all, made the winds of, uh, of change speech, uh, when that happened, he felt uncomfortable because the relationship between the Church of England and the state was not meant to be uncomfortable. And then, of course, you had people like uh, Enoch Powell, who was actually a theologian, whose book on St Matthew is one of the best books on St Matthew that have been written in recent years. Uh, a devoted high churchman, uh, hugely upset about the... Uh, about the Catholic Church, he, um, he said that we couldn't possibly have the Pope because it would cause terrible trouble in Britain if he were to come on that first visit. But of course, Enoch Powell had privatised religion so that for him, you could have the church-state relationship because it was comfortable, uh, because that was a perfect... Because that wasn't your real relationship with the church, that was a different relationship altogether. And that was apart from the relationship with the, between the church and state. So he would make uh, amazing statements about the meaning of, uh, am I my brother's keeper, he said. Am I my brother's keeper? Did our Lord answer yes? No, he did not. He asked, am I my brother's keeper? And he would leave you in that sort of position. And it was all an intellectual thing that he himself had. So he had no difficulty with the established church because he saw it as a proper, comfortable, reasonable arrangement which was historically defensible and which is where we were. And it didn't interfere with his relationship or his attitude to religion at all. Now, since then, we've had... A, a whole series of other leaders, many of whom have had, are, and continue to be devoted Christians. 
The question, though, I think we have to ask is, is it really true that the establishment of the Church of England gives opportunities which are so important that that overcomes the manifest disadvantages which having this kind of stamp of respectability, which is frankly what the Church of England gives to the state. And I find it increasingly difficult to think that the balance is on the side of the church because I am absolutely clear in my mind that a Christian must say that it's the church that matters and not the state. Mm. That the idea that the state should be in charge of the church is, in my view, intolerable. And, of course, what we've ended up with is a Church of England which has a bureaucracy which is the only one that rivals in its tediousness and its expense the bureaucracy of the British government. And that is what the synodical government means. It also means a number of other peculiar things, which is that retired colonels are the people who should decide what the theological position of the Church of England should be. I find that quite a difficult thing to swallow, which was the second reason why I ceased to be an Anglican, because I was on the General Synod for long enough to realise that I wasn't a suitable member of this body, nor did I believe that it had a suitable role in life. But why it's there is, of course, because Parliament used to make those decisions. When it became obvious that Parliament was unsuitable, they had to have something else. And so I end by saying, uh, I think that there is a real reason why Christians, and particularly Anglican Christians, should ask themselves whether their position in relationship to the state is now so compromising, not enabling them to speak out, that it would be better to forego the real advantages, and I don't mean those in the sense of pecuniary ones, I mean advantages for preaching the gospel, which we so often list. And it came to me very particularly when we were debating same-sex marriage. Now, I happen to think that the state should properly allow people of the same sex to get married. That, I have no doubt about that. I spoke about it. I take it very seriously. Because it is a state decision, because state marriage is wholly different from what I understand as a Catholic uh, to be marriage. Of course, the Church of England, all the time as I listened to speeches, particularly the excellent speeches of the Archbishop, were struggling with the concept that it might be true that marriage in a, in a church and state situation, the marriage that they were talking about was not the marriage which the state sought. Or it was much more difficult for bishops to try to make that division because it's almost impossible for the Church of England to say, yeah, there are two kinds of marriages. There's church marriage and state marriage. But we are the state church, so where do we come into that picture? And you couldn't help sit there and listen to those speeches and know perfectly well that the morality of the Church of England will be the same as the morality of the state. They'll just take a bit of time to catch up on it. Perhaps this will be the least popular thing I have to say. In the 19th century, the Church of England fought for nearly a hundred years to stop the remarriage with a divorced, with a, with a, a dead uh, wife's sister. It's wrong, they said, because it says it's wrong in, in Leviticus. It's the same verse, actually, that says that homosexual behaviour is wrong. And uh, they fought it. And in the end, they lost. Now it is perfectly accepted by the Church of England. All arranged, change the rules, everything's okay. But if you are the state church, how long can you stand for a different morality 
on abortion, on uh, same-sex marriage, on all those issues where the state takes a different view. And I find it very worrying, because although I may be less orthodox than some on some of these issues, I happen to think an issue like abortion is something where Christians have a wholly different view about the sanctity of human life. But it isn't a view that the Church of England can properly hold because of its relationship with the state. And as that relationship goes on, so it is, and here's a wicked word, emasculated and unable to stand for what Christians should stand. And I think that means that it's time to finish it. Wow. Someone's back to camp.